I'm going to make an assumption that most of you have driven on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Is that a good assumption? Okay, good. A few times? Yeah. Um, can you tell me, uh, just you know, a couple of shout outs, what's different about the parkway than a regular road that you drive on on a daily basis? It's beautiful. It's beautiful? Okay. No stoplights. No stoplights. No commercial. -commercial. Non commercial. Low speed limit. All right, low speed limit. <laughs> Too many bikers. <laughs> Too many curves? <laughs> no, 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 okay. All right. Yeah. No views. All right. Yeah, absolutely. There's views, and every time you go around a corner, does it look different? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, keep that in mind. I, I got really interested in the parkway kind of in a backwards way. Um, I got invited to work on the Kona State uh, early on um, with some students. And um, the parkway wanted to know more about the cones. And I wanted to know more about the cones. You know, there's just that sign with the, if you've been out to the cone estate, it's just like maybe a paragraph, not even that, of what the cones did. And I always wondered, like, this house does not look like other houses on the parkway. It doesn't look like other, you know, other places. So I um, had a chance to learn more about their history, and it kind of spiraled into uh, more about uh, the furnishings. And I had lots of students work on that project. And because the estate was on the Blue Ridge Parkway, I also got interested in the Blue Ridge Parkway. So um, eventually um, hosted some, as uh, Jasmine talked about, a couple of NEH, National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, teaching uh, workshops where teachers from all around the country came to learn about the parkway. And that was really fun. And I, I learned a lot more than I, than I ever knew. So um, what I thought I would do uh, tonight is kind of talk a little about the history and of how it came to be and why it's here and not somewhere else. Um, and then um, kind of like you go around a corner and there's a different view and you go around another corner, I've got a few uh, stories that I like to hear, or I like to hear, yeah, and I like to tell um, about things that happened along the parkway over different times. So I'll see um, how many I can get in. Um, I'll do sort of my brief stories and then if you want to know more afterwards, I'll leave time for questions. Okay. So this was sort of the question I asked, what do you notice about this road? And you all you know, chimed in about it. And I think it's really important to really think about that. Why is this road so different? And how did it get to be that way? So these are the icons you often see if you're driving along the parkway. You see these mile markers. And you see signage that tells you that you are on the Blue Ridge Parkway. So the parkway runs uh, 469 miles. Uh, it was built over a long period of time. A lot of people think it was only built during the, the Great Depression, but it was built from 1933, and you see that the final piece was uh, finished in 1987. So that's a long time to build a road that's 469 miles long. Um, for those of you who may not be aware, it was really built to be what they used to call the park-to-park -park road. So it's, it was built to link the Shenandoah National Park uh, to the Great Smokies National Park. So you can see that's how it is. Now at one point there was a decision, uh, Tennessee wanted it to go through not only Virginia and, and North Carolina but through Tennessee. And there's a, there's a great chapter in uh, Ann Wisnut's book uh, called The Super Scenic Highway and it talks about the whole kind of kerfuffle over that. Um, in the end North Carolina won and Tennessee lost in that case. Um, you can see that the altitudes vary. Um, the, sort of the average is between three and 4,000 feet. Um, if you're in you know, Boone, you're about 3,333 feet if you're at the stadium, um, but who's counting? And, um, and it, the highest point is closest to, uh, the end of, closest to the Smokies, and that's over 6,000 feet. And also Mount Mitchell, which is the highest peak uh, east of the Mississippi, is along the parkway. It's a state park, but it's... It, it, is there too. So who built the parkway? And then I'm gonna talk about why did they build the parkway. So during 1933, as the Great Depression was happening, Roosevelt, uh, Theodore, or, sorry, Theodore, Theodore, no. Let's try Franklin. Franklin Roosevelt uh, was you know, trying to figure out a way to boost the economy. Um, he created many uh, alphabet types of organizations. The Public Works Administration was uh, the one that is responsible for eventually creating other pieces of it, like public works and um, 
and then the CCC, and that's the agency that funded the Blue Ridge Parkway. But they funded lots of other work projects. And in fact, we were just talking earlier, there's, there's all around this area, there are CCC um, buildings that were built by the you know, Conservation Corps or by contractors who then also had them come in. Um, they needed to secure land, and that was left up to the states. So North Carolina secured the land for the North Carolina section. Virginia uh, bought the land up for, or took the land for Virginia. I'm gonna talk a little about that in a second. Uh, the idea was for construction to begin um, in the poorest areas, and where it really began in 1935 was at the border between Virginia and North Carolina. So if you go up and right when you cross that state line, that's where the very first part of the parkway started. Um, one of the things that people, I've heard people say is that it was built by the CCC. I don't know, have, have you heard that before? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the CCC was heavily involved and that conservation, the Civilian Conservation Corps was made up of young men typically 18 to 25, maybe a little older. And um, that was another program that came out of the New Deal. Those guys, most, it was all guys, um, were put into camps. There were several camps along the, the parkway. But one of the things that they did was to help plant trees, clear areas. Um, they built a lot of the um, rest areas and the picnic grounds that you go to. So um, there are water fountains you'll see that are built of stone. They help do that. So they were doing a lot of the sort of ancillary work. The really building of the road was done by people, uh, companies that were contracted by the federal government, paid by the federal government to do that work. So it's a combination. Um, the CCC guys were uh, paid uh, 25 to 30 dollars a month and they had to send 25 it was 30 because they sent 25 of the money home to their to their families so um, you know and the other thing about the CCC that's really interesting is they had planned menus they were supposed to be very nutritious meals and there were people who were responsible for going to the camps and making sure that the the CCC guys were getting their right kinds of food, right? And there are, um, I was in the archives down in South Carolina when I was working on the Kings Mountain um, project, and there are menus, and then there are notes from the, you know, sort of the people who came around to make sure they were doing, and it says, not enough protein, or, you know, you're serving too cheap a food, or these kinds of things. So it's really interesting, and I think, um, you know, one of the reasons I think people joined the CCC, one, there was no work, but it also gave them, you know, some good food and place to be and, and those kinds of things. So around here, um, numbers of people went uh, to the CCC camps on the Blue Ridge Parkway um, during the time of the construction of the scenic, uh, which is another word for what they were calling Blue Ridge Parkway. Okay, so if you've driven along the parkway, do you know what they're doing right there? Yeah, those are like gutters or they're the, you know, the drains that help take the water off the road. So those are, um, were laid by hand and you can still see that. If you, if you get on the parkway and you look on the right or the left, sometimes you can see those drains. And then the other thing that's really interesting is how many retaining walls are along the sides that you don't see when you're driving on it. But those also were, you know, built and they were, a lot of them were very um, difficult to build in order to shore up uh, the road bank bed. So these are CCC guys planting trees. Um, think about the parkway now, you think about trees. I mean, you see lots of trees, or you stop and you look out over and over, but it's trees, lots of trees. People come up here in the fall because there are trees <laughs> with pretty leaves. So uh, when the parkway was being built, um, most of the area around that, you know, where the parkway runs had been um, timbered there wasn't a lot of trees left. And so there was a lot of erosion. And that was true across the country. And so the planting of trees that the CCC did, and it was over a billion trees across the country, it changed the landscape. It changed the weather patterns because of all those trees. So where there had been drought, having a lot of trees, you know, more moisture. So, I mean, it's, it's not 
insignificant how important those CCC uh, workers were. Okay, so um, this is a, a postcard from um, one of the uh, young men who is living down at a camp down east. And he's writing back to his hometown in Pennsylvania. And he's talking about how he had to come up to the mountains to uh, get some materials, and he was going to take them back. And, uh, you know, basically says, hey, I just drove up here. It's really beautiful. Um, and then he talks a little about his girlfriend, I think, is what's in there, um, and then just says bye. But, you know, he sends a postcard of the Blue Ridge Mountains, and I think that was kind of cool. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, is there anything problematic about this picture on your left? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> could be a problem. I don't know. I, um, <laughs> I ran across this picture and I thought it has to be staged, right? It just has to be. Um, but one of the things that was, uh, that happened a lot and how it got built, I mean, you can see how some of those cuts have been made and, you know, putting in dynamite and then exploding the dynamite and then taking the rock out and doing it over and over again. And this was very difficult work, even if you had uh, bulldozers and traffics, or tra traffics, bulldozers and tractors. So I just, you know, when you're driving, next time you drive on the parkway and you're going up a hill and down a hill and around a corner, imagine this. <laughs> not the, not the, the explosion, but the rest. So um, here they're spreading, uh, you know, what kind of is asphalt, but really wasn't as asphalt. It's, you know, it's tar and, and rock. Um, but a lot of the parkway for a long time wasn't paved. Um, and so they paved it slowly. And, um, you know, even today, there's a whole section right now kind of between Deep Gap and up by um, um, Route 18, yeah, up, up by West Jefferson. And that's all closed right now because they're repaving it. Um, and there's a lot of maintenance that has to be done all the time, and that's one of the, you know, upkeep of the parkway is, is a full-time job. Um, so I just think it's very interesting, you know, how it must have been in the early days, in the 40s and 50s, in those cars versus, you know, how it is now. So you want to get people here, and so there were a lot of uh, people who were interested in boosting the tourism. And so there is a Blue Ridge Parkway Association that was made up of various uh, uh, sort of uh, commercial businesses that were close to the parkway. You know what they really wanted, though? They wanted to be on the parkway. They wanted hotels. They wanted maybe some billboards. They wanted a gas stations. And, and so there was tension, right? Because you know, right after, you know, in the 40s and then especially in the 50s, there was a lot of pressure to get tourism to this area. And so you can read about how the, the you know, Blue Ridge Association, the commercial part of the game, was trying to push the National Park Service to open it up to more of this. And in the end, um, there were gas stations built by the National Park Service on the parkway. So if you've ever been up to Downton Park, you'll see there's one there. Um, but they really made the case that what people should do is make gas stations, stores, attractions just off the parkway so that people could exit and then go there. And I think that's what happened. Um, I'll show you a cartoon in a second, a little later on, and you can see what would have happened if not. Okay, so how did people get, how did the government get the land? And I talked a little about that that was how the states, they were responsible for getting the land. So, <clears throat> you know, it was eminent domain. Um, and the thing about eminent domain is it wasn't very equitable. So, um, for the farmers who may have just had a, you know, a few acres along where they wanted to route the parkway, um, they would come and they would tell them, this is what we're going to give you for your land, and we're going to take this land. And you could go down to the courthouse of your county that the, where, where you were located, and there would be a, a kind of a sheet of paper in the courthouse, and it would say, you know, whatever your land was, and this is how much they were going to pay you. And so... You know, um, this person, I'll read, um, let's see if I can read it here. S.A. Miller, he wrote to the president, and part of what he said to Roosevelt when he found out what they were going to pay for his land, uh, he said, um, 
President Roosevelt, the park to park highway isn't any benefit to us, according to what they tell us. We aren't allowed to put any buildings near it, not even cross it, our land or the other side. And he goes on to talk about how they couldn't take their produce to market, they couldn't take their tractors on the road. It was gonna, you know, it's just, it was <coughs> terrible. And he was offered $5 for his, uh, per acre. And um, he didn't have, I mean, he, there was no argument. He didn't have the wherewithal or the money to be able to, you know, figure out how to, to fight that. So um, S.A. Miller loses his land. And actually, um, his relatives also, um, I'll, I'll talk about that story in a little while, but um, for people who did have, um, you know, the wherewithal in terms of money and um, sort of being able to help with uh, lawyers, those folks had um, a different uh, kind of experience with the, um, especially in North Carolina. So there's a couple places, I don't know, how many of you have been to Little Switzerland? How many entrances to Little Switzerland off the parkway are there? <coughs> yeah, I mean, a lot. I mean, more than one, right? And, and so, you know, the, the man who had started that as a, as a resort, he was um, connected in North Carolina. And he was able to make a case of, you know, wanting for his, his piece of land um, to have entrances off the parkway. And so he got those. Um, similarly, you know, there was... Um, Grandfather Mountain also, uh, Hugh Morton had um, access and was able to uh, work around some of the things that the National Park Service wanted to do with the area around Grandfather Mountain. So um, I think, you know, when you think about that, in North Carolina, there was differences just kind of by, you know, where you were, who you were, and, um, and what your land was. In Virginia, uh, Virginia was more... Uh, I guess they gave more uh, credence to their to the people who were they were buying the land from, so they left a lot. Uh, they had a smaller easement next to the parkway, and if you drive out of North Carolina and into Virginia, you'll see that there are way more exits off the parkway. That the easement is it, so the road is narrower in the sense that um, there are buildings built up closer to the road than in North Carolina. So the Virginia part, a lot of people say isn't as aesthetic because they did that. But on the other hand, they were more um, interested in making sure that the people who lived there maybe got more, uh, got to keep their land more. So North Carolina, wider easements, uh, less ways to get on and off, more beautiful uh, drive, but at the expense of maybe some of the people who lived along there. So. Um, you know, thinking about public good, that's a, that's a good example of how it varies. So here's just a, a timeline for everybody. Um, you can see starting in 1935, last part of the parkway finished in 1987. You can see it's really interesting, you know, during the Second World War and then after, almost nothing was done because there was so much, yeah, there was, you know, men were off the war, uh, women were working in the factories, uh, doing other things that, I mean, everybody was caught up in that, and then there was the money. I mean, when they came back, there were other jobs um, to do other than, um, you know, pave a, a parkway. So the scenic, as it was called, um, really the purpose was to um, build a connection between the two parks and um, really thinking about uh, helping unemployment by employing people to work, not just in the CCC, but also in businesses. And then one of the things to think about, too, is why do you need a parkway unless you have cars? So at the same time that the parkway is starting to be built, um, the number of cars in the 1930s is going up. Um, and you can see there, 3% of the population owned a car in 1935, and it only gained more, especially after the Second World War. So no need for a parkway unless you get cars. Uh, just some pictures here. You can really see, um, you know, uh, and this, I think, um, is uh, R. Getty Browning with that scope. Um, is that, can you tell? It looks like him, yeah. And he was the site engineer, walked for, he worked for North Carolina, and he walked the whole parkway to site it. Um, the other person who's um, uh, usually named is um, 
Stanley Abbott. And he had been um, trained as a landscape architect and had worked up in New York on the parkway there. And he came down and his, you know, he was part, they were really a good team. Um, I think Argetting Browning probably knew the land and um, Abbott was more about kind of the aesthetic sometimes. And uh, people have talked about that the parkway was, you know, kind of painted by a comet's tail. But when you see people, you know, bomb, you know, dynamiting the land and, you know, scraping the land and putting rock on and all these things, it's, it's not built with a comet's tail. It was built by people and it was very hard work. Um, so, uh, but it, it, it's a, I think a really amazing um, space. Okay, so this is the other thing I wanted to um, kind of keep in mind. So Stanley Abbott, uh, was really interested in the aesthetic of how the parkway would look. And when you drive along the parkway today, you see a lot of um, fences, a lot of split rail fences. You see cabins that have been moved in there. You rarely see um, near the parkway a house that was made of planks, a wooden house. It's, they've, they've sort of, they, they got rid of those houses when they built the parkway. And they kept the cabins, and then they built, um, log fences. And the reason they did that is Stanley Abbott was really trying to look at what the aesthetic of Appalachia was, not in 1930, but back in what, what, you know, maybe he was talking about the good old days. I'm not sure that the good old days in the 18th century or 19th century was that great, but um, that was the aesthetic he was going for. And so um, you'll see all along the parkway places where y you get that real Appalachia, which may not have been, it was not the real Appalachia in the 1930s. Um, then you have the Kona State, and so I'm, I'm juxtaposing the cabin, which is up uh, in Downton Park, to the Kona State. Which one of those was built first, do you think? Okay. Yeah, so they were built the same, more or less the same year, a couple of years okay. apart, yeah. So um, that so the problem with the Kona State is it didn't go with with the aesthetic of Appalachia because um, they weren't really you know thinking about that. Uh, but I find that really interesting because it, the Park Service has never known what to do really with the Kona State. It just doesn't fit um, in the you know kind of the rest of of what they what they show along the Parkway. That's another picture. So now when you drive, you just keep your eyes out. You'll just, now everything you see will be that, you know, fencing in the, in the cabins. Um, the Linco Viaduct is uh, really a, a marvel. <laughs> um, and it took a very long time to get it built because there was a lot of controversy on where it would go. And um, there were people who argued that it was um, environmentally dangerous. Um, but they actually never did an environmental study of it. <clears throat> So anyway, there's that. They would now. They would never get it built now. In fact, the, probably the whole parkway probably wouldn't get built now. But um, nonetheless. So the uh, last piece of this was put in place in 1987. They used um, a construction method called um, progressive erection. And when I say that to a class of um, freshmen, it gets more giggles. But anyway. <laughs> um, but it was, it was really cool because so they, they poured these pieces and they used um, computer technology to figure out exactly what size, how they the turn, the amount of, um, you know, for each one. And if you ever get a chance, sometimes they'll close the, the Cove, uh, Lynn Cove viaduct and you can walk across it. And there's, there's absolutely no space between each piece. I mean, it was so well done. And um, so that, that's what the, uh, was going on. And then... Um, if you want to, if you haven't been there, there's a visitor center just on the south side of the park of the Linco Viaduct. And there's a visitor center there, and they have video of them doing this. They have a model, and you can walk under the viaduct. Is the business it may not be right now. Is it closed? It's been closed for a while. Is it through COVID? No, it's closed because the building is, is not in good shape. Just the bathroom. Oh. Oh, they're going to rebuild it though. Okay, well, when it gets open again, you need to go and. But you can do the walk, right? Yes. Yeah, and I think the walk is really cool. And the thing is, you can see underneath there's space in there, and there's some bats that live up in there, especially like you know, and uh, bats. 
and, uh, and, and it's, yeah, and they're a species of bat that you don't see very often, and so the biologists actually climb up there every once in a while and check on the bats. Anyway, random information that you need to know. So, yeah, it's really, it's really something. Okay, so this was my cartoon. This was in 1993, Charlotte Observer, and um, some of the things that they're saying is, hey, there's a Walmart, Toys R Us, look, Henry, 50 uh, factory outlets, and this is, it's not the same uh, parkway that it used to be. So they're always, every once in a while, there are kind of fussing about whether they should have more commercial, um, you know, things along the parkway, and so this is, this is 1993. Okay, so, um, all right, let me tell a couple stories, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to questions. So these are my overlooks. So um, this one is about Pine Spur, which is up in Virginia. And um, in the, uh, prior to Brown versus Board of Education, uh, in the South, right, we had, there was segregation. And, um, while the Blue Ridge Parkway was a federal property, they were in states like Virginia that had, in North Carolina, that both had segregation laws. And so, um, for the most part, the parkway kind of ignored that, but they did set aside um, in places uh, where the bathrooms would be whites only or, um, or for African Americans only. And um, they did have... Uh, a, they had a project that they were working on prior to Brown versus Board of Education at Pine Spur. And they drew all this, uh, they had a whole plan for this recreational area, and it would be, and as, as they put on the, on the um, plan, Negro only. And they were, the idea was for the Park Service was to draw as many African Americans from Washington, D.C. out to this particular part of the parkway. And this would be um, only for African Americans. Um, and so it wasn't going to be segregated. They were trying to kind of get around that and not have to deal with the idea of um, having whites and blacks at the same place. Before they got it done, um, they, uh, Brown versus Board of Education passed in 1954 or, or became uh, the law. And, um, and so they, they sort of just scrapped it. They left Pine Spur, and you can still see Pine Spur, and it's still a recreation area, but it didn't um, end up being uh, only for African Americans. And the same thing at the Bluffs, which is now Doughton Park. If you've been up that way, you'll know that there's a restaurant there, there's um, gas station and bathrooms. And what they would do there um, during the time that they were trying to avoid uh, having a segregated area was to direct white visitors to that area up on, on the top of the hill and the picnic areas there. And for the African American visitors, which were not very many at the time, they would direct them behind the restaurant and down um, below. And so, um, and then at the campgrounds, this is a campground up in, in Virginia, they had areas in the campgrounds where they would direct whites to one part of the area and blacks to the other part of the area without um, signage really, but just the rangers would do that. So this is the bluffs there, now Downton Park. Um, and this is uh, one of the uh, bathrooms and you can still, um, it's still there. You can go down below the, the, in the back of the restaurant and inside there you can still see the separate signage. Um, you can tell where it was, uh, blacks and whites or whites and Negroes is how it was put. Yeah, so that's that one story. Um, now I want to talk a little about the groovy camp, Camp Catawba. Anybody know about Camp Catawba? Yeah, anybody go to Camp Catawba? Okay. So um, this was located not, uh, it was just off of, um, of 321, um, and before you get into Blowing Rock, um, and this woman named Vera Lockman uh, she was a, a classicist, and she ran um, a German kindergarten. Um, she was uh, Jewish, and when the Nazis began to uh, expel and to put uh, and, and push people into ghetto and um, 
and then into concentration camps, she escaped Germany and came to the United States. Um, she first uh, taught, she taught up in New York, um, uh, classics, and then she came down the first summer she was here in 1943, and she came to uh, Black Mountain. And there she um, had a, ran a kind of a boys camp that year. And then the next year she went back to New York and she decided um, she would set up a camp near Blowing Rock, um, which she did, and she called it Camp Catawba. And she asked her friends, uh, also who had escaped Nazi Germany, if they wanted to send their children from New York down to Blowing Rock for them to have a camp for 10 weeks. And it turns out most of her friends at the time had sons. And so they sent their sons down, um, ages like 7 to 12. And um, they sent them by train down to Hickory. And a farmer would go down, and the guy who lived next door in his truck, and he picked them up like that, <laughs> and drove them up the, up the mountain, and she ran a boys' camp. And that was the first year, and after that, it was only a boys' camp after that. Um, it was, uh, especially in those early years, it was mostly Jewish kids that had, uh, their family had escaped to Ger from Germany. Um, after that, it was opened up uh, to other boys as well. And then, in 1964, it was the, the first African-American boy was part of that camp. So it was, you know, for the time, it was, it was pretty interesting um, because the things that they're doing at camp, uh, she's, this is uh, at night, she's talking, she's telling the story about Homer um, and the Iliad. Uh, uh, they, they made a swimming pool, they would go on hikes, they did uh, art, and uh, they had her partner was, um, a, a played the recorder, uh, Tui St. George, and uh, so they, they lived in New York during the year and then the summers down here. Um, they taught music. And what's really interesting is uh, one of the guys uh, who went to camp early on, he wrote a book um, called The Assembly of Catawba, and he tracked down all the campers that he could. And he found out that most of them were in some kind of arts or music or something like that. So, you know, I don't know what the correlation is, but it seems like it's pretty strong that, you know, having this experience, and some of them came year after year. Uh, they even came during the um, polio epidemic in Hickory. And so um, it's a, it's a, I think it's a fascinating story. And the reason I'm talking about it is because when uh, uh, Vera Lachman passed away, she uh, deeded the, um, to her partner. And then when she passed away, it went to the Park Service. So I got involved because um, they had just acquired this and they were looking for people to help figure out what was going on there and if could we do oral histories. And so I, I had a class um, I was teaching on the parkway. And so our project we did was we went out to Camp Catawba and everything was still there. Soup in the cupboards, clothes in the closets. Um, and, and so we cleaned, we cleaned it out. Um, there were three, four structures. One of the structures had been early on, this property had been um, a chicken farm. So there was a big chicken coop, like big, I mean two-story chicken coop kind of thing. And that was the dorm. It had been changed into the dorm. But anyway, it was, I mean, it's, the more you read about this, the cooler it gets, and, or the groovier it is, I guess, is the way to say. And we were able to do some um, oral histories with, um, with some of the people who had been campers there. When did it close? Uh, it closed in 1972. So she did it for quite a while. Um, and I think it got more wild as they got closer to the 70s, would be my understanding. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So um, let me tell you a little about the Kona State and how it relates to the parkway. So um, how, how many of you have been to the Kona State? Is it well known? OK. Good. That takes some pressure off. All right, so you see that fence there in the front of the house in that walk right there. All right, so when um, the parkway was getting close to Blowing Rock, uh, they began to put stakes along where they were going to where the parkway was going to go. So Mrs. Cohn, Bertha Cohn, was there, and their stakes were now in the, her front yard, and she learned that the parkway was going to come through her front yard. She was not very happy about that. So, like any person would do, 
um, she first wrote to the um, Secretary of the Interior, and um, and she, you know, basically said, you know, I don't want this road to come through my through my front yard, and she didn't really get a very good answer. So, who would you write to next? Yeah, absolutely. That's what you do. <laughs> So she wrote to Mr. Roosevelt, I'm an old lady and feel that if I die, changes are desirable, of course. I will not be able to demur. Think of the road being made through your dear mother's home, place, Hyde Park, is what she's talking about, or your own, the White House. Um, hundreds of trees and shrubs would be destroyed. She had eventually won, uh, and then she, you know, she, so th then she invites um, Harold Ickes down. He's the Secretary of the Interior, and she has him sit on her front porch and look out. And then she you know, basically says, really? You're going to take this road, you know? And so I think Ickes was like, we don't want to deal with this woman. <laughs> and so um, they just kind of leave it. And they stop working in their area, and they move on. And then she dies in 1947. And so at that point, they decide, they've remapped it. And instead of running in front of the house, they put it behind the house. And, it's, and if you've driven that part of the road, you'll know that there's a big field on one side and then the house and things on the other. Well, that was contiguous when she was there. You've got to imagine without a road. Um, and so, you know, you have to cross, you go under the bridge and you go up the hill. Um, and their graves are up at the top. But again, that would have been a contiguous property and not split up by a road going through it. Um, so, you know, in a sense, she won concession, but in the end, it went by. But then I would argue we probably wouldn't see this house unless there was a parkway. So um, her plan was to just close the house up and never let it be open again and just let it fall down. Um, that was part of her wishes and her will. But again, that wasn't honored. <laughs> um, and just, um, I don't know if you've seen a picture like this. This is looking from her porch out. So this is... At the, side, at the top is the Bass Lake, and that's all the apple trees. There were over 50,000 apple trees on the property. And um, actually, Sue, you have part of that China, like part of the apple grove that um, you still have, right? And so they had um, over by Green Park Inn, down the mountain a little, there was a, there was a apple orchard there, and then there were apple orchards kind of where you turn off of 221 and go down to, what is that road? The quick, I um, can't think of it. Anyway, so you can really imagine that property in a much different way with all those apples there. All right. And that's a picture again from the front porch where her and uh, Harold Icky sat rocking and talking. And you can see this, she was a very formidable person. Would you want to, I wouldn't want to cross her. <laughs> and these are the letters that she sent. And this is, so the reason I know some of this, other than the letters, is that I had the opportunity to um, interview uh, both these women. They were her grandnieces. And um, they were in their 80s when I got to interview them. And they had spent every summer uh, from the time they were like eight until they were in college um, at the estate. And they could, I mean, they remembered every detail. You know, where the cake sat, how they went up the stairs, who worked there. And so that was the, it was the greatest pleasure ever to, to interview these people. And this is uh, these two women. And what, I, what we know about the, the house and the furnishings, that all came from their memories. Um, a lot of it came from their memories. They've both passed now, but only recently. OK. One more, and then I'll, I'll cut it off. All right. Um, so the Smith sisters. So these two women, uh, when they retired, one, one had been a physic education teacher and one had worked in healthcare. When they retired, they decided that um, they were they loved wildflowers, and they began to drive up and down the parkway um, and campaigning to stop the mowing along the along the route so that the flowers would grow. Um, so it's Helen and Julia Smith, and um, they kept these kind of journals where they would talk about on at this mile marker. I saw these kinds of flowers and these kinds of flowers, and um, and and then you know they would and finally and they they would write letters. They would write letters to the superintendent and just say, "You can't keep mowing these flowers down. These are beautiful. They'll go away. You have to stop. Here, look at this. 
at this area that we were just at, this mile marker, there used to be these beautiful, you know, um, daisies, and they're gone. What are you doing? And, just, and they would write letter after letter after letter. Five years later, they changed the mowing policy on the parkway. So one of the things that the, you know, if you talk about the, with the parkway folks, they'll say, well, we were going to do that anyway. We, we knew, we knew it was important to, you know, make sure that we had these wildflowers that people could see. Um, it just was interesting that it was about the same time that they were advocating for that to happen. So, I mean, maybe, maybe it was a melting of the minds, but um, anyway, they did a lot. And so now a lot of times when you're driving on the parkway, you'll see this instead of just mown grass. And sometimes people complain that the parkway looks too messy, but the reason it looks a little messy is because they want to try to encourage wildlife, uh, wildflowers. So thank you to the Smith sisters. Yeah. So I'll stop there. Yeah. Thank you. I could go all night, but I won't. <laughs>